So it's my honor this morning to be able to read in your hearing the word of the God, uh, word from the Lord, which Doug will be preaching on later. Um, out of respect and reverence for the Holy Word, I would ask that you stand together as we read this, please. This morning, we're reading from Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 25 through 35. And it reads, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. This is the word of the Lord.
Amen. Amen. That's great. I didn't get the rest of it, but I got the whole thing. Oh, thank you. I uh, am very excited about talking to, uh, about this hope in the midst of trouble. Uh, it seems like it's just a message that's been bubbling up. Uh, I'm just sitting uh, in the services this morning, just super excited to get up here and speak with you. So uh, I'd like to just start with a word of prayer. Uh, give, uh, uh, give the Lord the, the, the first place. Jesus, thank you for the fact that you are the word and you are our hope. I love that. Pastor Timothy gave us a, a word. That word is, is that you are the hope. And as we look at these examples, we look at your word, Lord, I pray that, that people would look to you and that I would get out of the way and the words that you need to communicate to people would get to them. And that whether people are, are at home or here, whether they're seeing this service later, that you would grant them hope, to teach them how to be lifted up in that hope and have light in this Advent season. We thank you and we praise you, and we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we are jumping into this Advent, we're talking about hope, hope particularly in, in trouble. I think this year is a great year to talk about that because it's 2020, and it is what everybody knows it is. But as I thought about hope, I thought of this example of my own life. When I was a, a kid, Christmas time, you know, I really, really anticipated Christmas. You know, we didn't do Advent a lot, but now that, that we do Advent and I, I'm learning lots more about Advent, I'm doing it every year at, at Cornerstone, it has become such a rich anticipation of Christmas time and the, this time and in the future. But when I was a kid, I had, I had a hope too. You see, I'm the youngest of seven children, and I cannot remember any time in all the years I was growing up that, that I was disappointed Christmas morning. I had a absolute confidence in the, the wow factor, the good that my dad would create um, when we were, were young kids. And I, as far as I can tell, all of my siblings feel the same way. The way it worked in our household is nobody could go back into the new room. The new room was a kind of dormitory for all the five boys growing up. And we had a long hallway and then the dormitory room called the new room. Nobody could go in the hallway or you can't look down the hallway. You can't go in the new room. You had to wait till dad got up. And he got up at the excruciatingly late time of eight o'clock in the morning, Sunday mornings. And I was up at like five o'clock and he would take us to midnight mass hopefully that we would sleep in. But at 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.30, we're just watching his bedroom door. Can't wake him up. We had some neighbor kids. Remember when we were kids? Some of you might remember the M16s. They don't give out guns anymore. But <laughs> makes the noise. Didn't wake up my dad. Nothing. Nothing doing. So he's sleeping in, gets up, and we're all, oh, got to have the coffee. We're ready. He gets, finally, he says, go. Oh. We get to run down the hallway and see the big present that we got that would be unwrapped. And, and I remember oh, never being disappointed. I got a BB gun once, four birds in the neighborhood, and a bicycle when I was seven. And the one I remember well, immediately came back to me. I ran in, I was 14, ran in, there were two surfboards there. Mine was the orange surfboard. And uh, man, it was just a wow factor. That's what hope is, in maybe a childish way. Hope has to do with an utter confidence of something good. I had an utter confidence that I would be wild, and as far as I can remember, every Christmas, that was true. When we talk about hope in the Bible, it's not hope in, in your dad. It's hope in your God that something good will come. It's that confidence Sure, I'm not wishing this to be true. It is a confidence. We are going to be looking at two characters in the Bible. One character from the Old Testament looking forward to the first advent and one character in the midst of 
the first advent that's looking forward from there. So if you want to, as I talk, you can turn to Genesis 50 because that's where we end up when we're talking about the Old Testament character Joseph. Joseph is in Genesis 37 through 50. We will not be covering all of that. I'll give a quick synopsis, but we're going to land in Genesis 50. Joseph literally was a person that's not just hope in trouble, but was literally hope in the hopeless. Many of us would know the story, the life of Joseph, as a, the 11th son of Jacob, and there was favoritism in the family, and he was one of the favorites, and he got this special robe, and he had a vision, dream from God, and he, like a not very bright young man, told them, and they got angry, and they were going to kill him, but they sold him to these Midian traders and took him off to, to Egypt, hated by his brothers, Deep, dark time for him. Throw, slow, uh, sold into slavery, thrown out of his own nation, and he's sold to this man named Potiphar. And God blesses him there. And he's raised up, and he's, he, he's the chief servant in Potiphar's house, and things are going pretty good. And then the wife took a liking to him, and when uh, he wouldn't sleep with her, she made up a story, and he gets thrown in jail, slammed down as a slave in jail. He waits years in jail. At this point, there's a couple of other people thrown in jail, a cupbearer, the king, and a baker, and they both have dreams. Joseph is able, by the power of God, to interpret the dreams, Baker didn't work out very well, but for the cupbearer, he would be restored. And when uh, he was getting ready to be put back into the, the Pharaoh's service, Joseph said, remember me. When you get restored, remember me. He didn't. Two years go by. The Pharaoh, the king, has a, a dream that no one can interpret. Finally, the cupbearer remembers Joseph in, in prison and says, there's a guy that can interpret dreams. Pharaoh brings him, he interprets the dream correctly. There were seven fat cows and seven lean cows, and it's talking about a fat uh, um, years of, of great uh, abundance and then years of famine. Pharaoh raises him up to second, only to the Pharaoh, and he's raised up again. And as time goes on, his brothers have to come down to Egypt. So they eventually move to Egypt. Joseph lets him, them know who he is, and he gives them and he provides for them in the land of Goshen, and his family is saved. Right before this verse that we're going to read, now dad, Joseph, or Jacob, dies, and the brothers are worried again. So they go to Joseph and say, dad told us that that uh, you should forgive us. And they bow down to him and ask Joseph to forgive them for all the trouble that they caused him. And he had already done it. It was already done in his heart long before this, and he was not going to take retribution. In fact, he makes a statement. Kind of brings us to why we're looking at him. He makes a statement that he knew he knew his God was with him, and he had hope in the midst of his hopeless situation or his trouble because he was confident in what God was doing. We know that by Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Let's look at that. It says, as for you, Joseph speaking to his brothers, as for you, you meant it against me, but God meant it for good. To bring about, bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And if you look, there is intent on both the brother's side and God's side. It says, You meant this for evil, speaking to his brothers, but God meant it, intended it for good. Circle those words in your Bible. So, the brother had intended to do something bad, but God still, he had intended to do something good. That is a hard lesson for us to swallow. 
God intends us to be in difficult situations to bring ultimate good. He has got the long-term version. He's got the vision for your life that would end up being good that's better than any quality that you could imagine had you not gone through that with the Lord. That made me think about my life before I came to Cornerstone. Sounds like I came here and it's a saving grace. Well, in a lot of ways it is. When I was at a church in, in Olympia, the Lord was kind of beginning to prompt us. And we kind of were looking to another place. Maybe God had done the work through us in that church. But that kind of ended a little more sudden than we thought it would. That was a little bit of a surprise. We prayed about, okay, what are our options? Didn't have any really ministry options at that time. And I had been thinking about potentially taking a, a job, a secular job, and a job opened up with my brother-in-law's moving company, and I wanted to be around sinners. And I've told you before, if you want to be around sinners, go work for a moving company. They're abounding in sinners. So I went to work for this moving company, and I'll tell you, Pretty much week one, I was in over my head. It was a branch that was in trouble, and uh, the work was hard, and uh, literally there were weeks that I was working 60 and 70 uh, hours. I'd go in at 5.30, and sometimes I wouldn't go home till 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. Sounds like a farming job. I know most of you guys got, ah, easy peasy, but it was hard. Stress, trying to keep this branch that was in trouble uh, getting to a place that was something great. It was really hard. The hardest vocational year of my life. There were once, more than once that I thought I was having either a heart attack or a stroke and might have welcomed it because it was so hard. And I'm thinking, many times, what? God, what are you doing? We felt like, God, you were doing something to move us? God, you, in the midst of this, this transition, you led us to this, this place? What are you doing? But yet, I can tell you, maybe hindsight's twenty twenty. but I can tell you that, that what happened in my life, I believe God intended me to be in that situation. He intended me to go through the trials. Two years before we transitioned out of the church, the Lord was kind of talking to us, and, and Lisa said, I think the Lord wants to do a deeper work within us. And I go, oh, great. I get to read my Bible or something. I get to, you know, I get to go and listen to podcasts or something. I didn't know he's going to send me through the ringer. But I'll tell you this. I grew more in that year and a half, two-year period than I had in the 15 before. Amazing thing that happened was that because I went to work for a uh, secular company, not right after ministry, I was, uh, uh, I was eligible for unemployment. So when, uh, at the end of this one year, I forgot to tell you a very important part about this little story, um, the VP walks into my office and says, hey, Doug, it's not working out. I go, wow, that sounds like I'm not going to have a job in the future. It can't mean that. I almost said, well, it's my brother-in-law's company. <laughs> he said, no. We need you to move out of the management job. You want to do it today or you want to do it tomorrow? So at 58, I was handed the walking papers. I had never, not McDonald's, not the skinny restaurant that I work for, not, I had never been fired from a job. And now I'm in my mid-50s and I'm fired and I, what am I going to do? Well, as I said, because I had worked for the company, I was able to get some unemployment, buy some time. Had I been unemployed directly from the church, it wouldn't have been available to me. So we searched and looking for jobs, it's terrible. We've all probably have done it. Ultimately ending up here. Unemployment ran out two weeks before I started here at Cornerstone. And I look back and I realized God was doing something bigger and better than he could never do through the comforts of my life. 
When I said I wanted to grow and I'm open to grow, Lord, he said, okay, I'm gonna put you through some trials, but I'm gonna be your hope. I'm gonna be your, your essence. I'm gonna be your power in this situation, even if you don't feel like it, even if you don't know what's going on. That's exactly what happened in Joseph's life. He grew to be a man that had great power, but yet was able to say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I understand that. And look what happened. Joseph had a longer-term perspective because of God. He knew that his people were blessed of God and his family was blessed of God. He knew that they would be significant. And look what happens. Four years, 430 years after the the life of, of Jacob and Joseph, there comes another savior, Moses. Moses takes them out in the Exodus and takes them into the wilderness. They wander around, messing it all up. They finally get into the promised land. They kind of mess that all up, and they go through all these, this history and judges and so forth, and they want a king. Finally, they come to this one king, who's very crucial in the history of Israel and our history, King David. God promises to that king that someday there will be a descendant of yours that will sit on a throne that will never end. His kingdom will be forever. He will redeem people for himself forever. And the history goes down through the many years down to Jesus Christ, that descendant of, of David, of Joseph, the light at the end, literally, at the end of the history that began with Joseph at the very beginning. We have a, a, another opportunity to look at a picture of hope in the, in the midst of trouble in the person of Simeon. Simeon, where we, uh, uh, Elder Mike read, is encountering this light at the end Let's talk a little bit about Simeon because he literally is the man who lived hope in trouble. Verses 25 and 26, it says, Now there was a man in in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout. That means he was right with every person and he was right with God. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, waiting for the comfort of Israel. The Holy Spirit was on him. Very interesting phrase because it means that the Holy Spirit stayed on him. Now, we're used to that theology in the New Testament because when the Holy Spirit comes uh, on the church, he comes in individuals and lives with us. In the Old Testament, before the coming of the Holy Spirit in, in the New Testament, he went on, uh, came on people and came off people. But the Holy Spirit rests on Simeon, stays with him, and it had been revealed to him that the Holy, by the Holy Spirit that he would see the Lord's Christ. He would see the salvation of Israel in the person. It was revealed to him. He was waiting his whole life for this sign that he would see. He believed, he had confidence that God would bring it to fruition, that he would see the Messiah. There's a friend of ours that that said something shocking in a small group. You see, uh, maybe two and a half years before she made that shocking statement, her daughter of 16 got cancer and died as a 17-year-old. We didn't really even know the the mom at the time, but she came to our church after the memorial, joined our, our small group, and two years into our small group, He said this statement, which shocked us. I'm really grateful for the death of my daughter. We were all quiet. Well, what do you say to that or about that? She said, "Uh, of course, I'm not grateful for the pain and suffering that, that we have had and the loss. I'd rather have her in my life. But I am grateful for this. Had I not lost my daughter, 
I would not be here. She didn't mean our small group. She meant in the Lord. I could have never got to a place to trust Christ and to trust Christ as my one and only hope in life. But because I saw my daughter, who was 16 and 17 years old, filled with faith, go to her end, go to glory with not a strat of doubt, it started me on the faith journey that ends in this total submission to God. You see, the last thing that, that the daughter said to the mom was, I'm ready to go home, mom. A few minutes later, she passed away. There's only certain things that can be done by the kinds of things we have to go through. And it is hard for us to think that God meant us to be in trouble. But yet, for someone like this mom or for myself, I would have never gotten to a place that I'm at in faith, without it. And I dare say, neither will you. So not only did he have hope in the midst of trouble, his nation waiting all this time with silence for another 400 years, Simeon finally has his hope realized. Reading on in in Luke 2, it says, and when he came in the spirit, the Holy Spirit brought him to the temple. And when the parents of, brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he was being presented as the firstborn and doing the, 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 what the law required of redeeming him as the firstborn. He took him up in his arm and blessed him and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all the people, the light, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people. Don't miss this. Here is the, here is the hope realized for Simeon. He is the light at the end of his life, literally, at the end of the Old Testament revelation. He is looking into the the very face of the baby that would be the savior of the world. Can you imagine seeing him holding this baby, looking down after all the years, and the Holy Spirit whispering to him, he's the one. He's the one. The one you've been waiting for. The one one that... Israel has been waiting for. And he looks out, and I could imagine that there would be tears running down his face, and he's just gazing in celebration. He says he glorified, he blessed God because he knew. And he said, I can go home now. I can go home in peace because I now see the light of the world, the salvation, the Messiah. What a Beautiful scene. And he prophesied over this child that he would be a light to the Gentiles and glory to Israel. Light to both of them. Don't miss it, because Jesus is a light to us. It goes on not to just proclaim that he's seen the Savior, but will actually prophesy towards the ministry that Jesus will do and ultimately accomplish being the light of the world. It goes on. After verse uh, 33, where the parents are amazed, are marveled, they keep hearing marvelous, wonderful, beyond understanding things about this child. It says, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed right now. He's destined. This child, as you see him, He is born Lord and Messiah as we speak. So it is a a prophecy that Jesus is a prophecy. There's a hope in a manger and a hope in a cross. And and, uh, Simeon is prophesying 
that right now this baby is the salvation of Israel, is the salvation of the world. He goes on and says, he is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Jesus is the dividing line. He will grow up to be the dividing line. The word rise uh, is associated with resurrection. So Jesus will be the dividing line between two people who will believe in him, rising to life and unbelief going to their own destruction. It says that, that he will be a sign, a sign that is a literal person in this case, pointing to the work of God in salvation, a sign that is opposed. We know that the ministry of Jesus was opposed by the religious leaders and ultimately got him killed. Goes down to the bottom of verse 35 to say, so that the thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. Jesus' life, as he does today, causes what is in our hearts to be revealed. We either are, are moving to a place of belief and trust in the Lord or in unbelief. Jesus is that line, and his ministry will be to challenge people to belief and rise in life or unbelief. And then he talks and prophesies that something in the future Pierce the heart of Mary. It says, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. What pierces Mary's heart as if it were a broad sword is seeing her son wrongfully accused, beaten, and then nailed to a cross. Mary is, is scarred for the rest of her life. Could you imagine, I can't even imagine as a father, but as a mother, seeing your, your child unjustly crucified. For what? For the sins of the world. For the redemption of Gentile and Jew alike. It goes on and speaks not in this passage, but in a passage way back in Israel by the prophet Isaiah. It says, Isaiah 53 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. And that he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We, turn, we turned away, everyone, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, that piercing in, in the, the heart of Mary would be our salvation, prophesied hundreds of years ago uh, before in the uh, words of the prophet Isaiah. He tells us that there is hope. There is hope for people that are hopelessly lost, hopelessly in trouble. Bob Goff gave us a quote that uh, Pastor Logan shared with me. I love it. It says, hope does not go to sleep just because it's dark outside. It lights a candle and stays up for the rest of the story. Isn't that what our Advent is all about? We light a candle of hope. And Pastor Timothy talked about how dark it was for them, but yet they saw a cross on the end of our building from the freeway. And that was kind of like a candle in the darkness. And through all the troubles and not being able to find a church home that they could, they could understand what was going on, they finally came to Cornerstone and seen that, that there, we have an interpreter. So as we think about Christmas, 
and all the, the anticipation that we have. Let's not forget the hope, the message of hope in the midst of Advent. A few things I want to uh, suggest that would hold on to this hope. First of all, hope in God and not in yourself. Hope in God and not yourself. I dare say if you're upset, if you're anxious, if you're angry, if you're taking things out on people, if you're despondent or you're hopeless, you're relying on yourself. It is easy to do. Either you you know you can't do it and you're kind of losing hope, or you're trying to do it and you think, I can do it by myself, and you realize I'm beating my head against a wall. There are things happening that none of us can do without the help of God. And 2020 is a great time to be hoping in in him. And second of all, hope in trouble. Hope in the midst of trouble. A junior high pastor friend of mine uh, told me this analogy. I never forgot it. He says, what happens when you shake a cup? You find out what's inside. And he says, God sometimes sends us into trials to shake the cup. And what spills out? Sometimes we're happy with it. Many times we're not. But don't let what splashes out discourage you. So let's say it's unbelief or anger or control. Make that a sign to say, you know, I need to hope in God. My life's a mess. It's getting shaken up, and I'm not quite sure I like what's getting shaken out. But God is doing this because he means it for good. And so you find out every time you get in trouble, you're a control freak. You tell everybody what to do all the time. You go, oh, you micromanage your subordinates. You micromanage your kid, your kid, your cat. Oh, you can't, you can't micromanage cats. They're un- untenable. The fact is, is that you look at that and say, wait a minute, that's coming out. I must, I must need to move to, to hope in my, my God. I need, I need somebody else to do this work because I can't do it. And the last thing is that we would hope in the finished work of, of, of Christ. When Simeon He probably didn't even know it, prophesied that that Mary's heart would be uh, stabbed with pain because of the cross. He didn't realize everything. But through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, the work is finished. What did he say on the cross? It is finished. Every bit of work that needs to be done when it comes to us is done. Because the problems that we have are nothing in comparison to the the sin problem we have in light of a holy God. It was said a number of weeks back that that Jesus is protecting us from a holy God. It is only the work of Christ. And if you're in trouble and you can't seem to find that peace in Christ, maybe it's time to submit to him. That's not a very popular word. But to say, like he told us, to all who believe in me and receive me, I give right to be the children of God. So once you get to the end of you and you realize because God has meant something hard in your life for your good, and you come to the end of you and you say, I I can't do it. You're meant to say that. And you're meant to turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need a cross. I am far from you. I've lived my life for myself, and it's a mess. Maybe it's really good, but you know it's ultimately a mess. I receive you. I believe in you and the work of the cross. I I receive you as Lord and Savior. That's the simple prayer. And whether you're at home or you're here, it doesn't matter if you've been around church world for your whole life. If something's happening in your heart and you know that that cup of yours is shaking and you know your faith is lacking, move to Jesus.
So when we start thinking about Christmas time and we see all the beautiful things, maybe it's the gifts, maybe it's the food, maybe it's the decorations, maybe it's the fond memory of Jesus being born. Remember that we have a hope in the midst of all troubles. It is that Jesus who was born in a manger and went to a cross to redeem us so that we would have hope in the end of all things. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you and we praise you because you are our hope in the midst. You are the hope in the trial and the troubles and you are the hope in the joys. You've given us power to be able to tackle our fears by giving them to you, our hopelessness by by releasing them, our lives by trusting you. You are truly our hope. We wait for you. At the end of our lives, you are the light of our, at the end of our lives, you are the light at the end of our world's existence. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen.